giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First Updates Now FRC is produced in partnership with Stryker. Discover why so many FIRST alumni and mentors are putting Stryker first when it comes to their careers. Visit careers.stryker.com forward slash FIRST to view openings, internships, and co-ops tailored to those who are in FIRST. That's careers.stryker.com forward slash FIRST. And by the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archived FIRST Robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at Loud, Live, and Independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to our showcase here. And today we have Aiden on from Team 610. He's gonna talk a little bit about his robot. We're gonna have a great show here for you today. And then if you guys want throughout the show, just ask us some questions and we'll be sure to ask them at the end, time permitting. Aiden, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a little more about what you do. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Aiden. I'm the co-head of design and manufacturing this year for Team 610. I was also our uh, team's driver for this year. Um, and yeah. Awesome. Let's just get right into it. So I know you have a little presentation prepared for us. Let's talk us through your robot. So just a little bit about us. Uh, we're Team 610. We're from Toronto, Ontario, uh, Canada. We're uh, from an all-boys school, Crescent School. Uh, this year we we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So if you're interested in uh, seeing our 20th anniversary video, uh, there's the link right there on the screen. Uh, so next, we just have our uh, reveal video. So, uh, not really. You guys always have like some of the best reveal videos. Who does your reveal videos? Wait, can they hear us? Oh. Uh, so we have our uh, media arts. Uh, we have our media arts program at our school, and a lot of the students who are co-involved in our program, uh, in the robotics program as well as the media arts program, usually take the lead on our uh, on our reveal videos. So this year's video is uh, done by shout out to Matthew Bissett and Dylan Zeitler with uh, some other footage done by other students who are involved in both programs. So a lot of the skills that they uh, use in the for making the video are uh, ones they've acquired from our media arts program. So it's also great because they get to use it as, uh, for example, a final project or uh, something for a different unit project. Yeah. And it's obviously like a big thing on your team to reveal videos. So how, how much time do you put towards it? Um, personally, uh, I've I've only been briefly involved with the reveal videos, uh, just helping with footage. But uh, so I can't speak to the amount of hours that they put into this. But I know that they put in a lot of effort, a lot of time into this. Uh, this year, they had to work even harder because with the no bag time, our schedule has been adjusted. So they had to work with a very limited amount of footage from our driver practice because that was pushed a little later uh, to make like this amazing reveal video, in my opinion. So. so you're one of the drivers on the team. So how does that balance work between you driving and the reveal video? I bet that might get a little tenacious. Um, well, basically, uh, like what always comes first is uh, driving comes first, like practicing the robot. Our reveal video isn't going to make us a better team. So it, the precedent is set that we uh, we have the driver practice and the like the guys doing the video usually will like uh, have to just work around and get what footage they can. We always make sure though that they have time to like get any specific shots they need or anything else. So Awesome. You want to go ahead and tell me a little bit about your build season? How did that robot come together? Uh, so beginning of build season, we, uh, just some stuff like maybe you may not know about us. We start out with a, uh, a rules test, which we, uh, do the day after the reel comes out, the reel comes out, we, uh, send everybody home. They study up on the, the new rules. Um, and then the next day everybody comes in for a rules test. Uh, you, it's pretty easy. Everybody usually passes on the first, second, third try. Um, and it's just mainly so we know that everybody has a grasp on like the different restrictions for this year's game and just what you need to know to build a robot. Uh, then we just make our 90% uh, score for winning our matches. So if we want to win 90% of our matches, what what score do we need to achieve? And then based on that, we make our needs and wants list to help us decide, us decide on different subsystems and 
make our major design decisions, such as maybe a, a tall versus a short robot. So maybe a little bit on that later. So this is just a little brief thing on our uh, our needs and wants list for this year. So basically, there's all the aspects of the game. We there's scoring power cells, there's a the shield shield generator, and there's also just things that we have to cover like movement. Our top of our priority list is always a uh, a drivetrain. So and what other like things accompany that drivetrain? Maybe a two speed, which we did have this year. Uh, also like different wheels. What we want to decide for our uh, drivetrain is. Is typically the top, and then we move down to see what we need or what we what we want and what we can actually accomplish. So, so here's just a little brief overview of our robot. Uh, all the subsystems are labeled. Our primary subsystems, uh, how what we call them, are our drivetrain number one, our intake uh, number two, our indexer, which is like single files all the balls for us. Uh, number three, our intestine, or what as we call it, which, which uh, feeds our balls from our indexer all the way up to our shooter. And then we have our uh, turret and our climb. So uh, here's just some of the iterations of our drivetrain. Uh, on the left, we have our first iteration before we did some driver practice. We made some changes for Durham. Uh, so on the second photo is our iteration we went to Durham with. Uh, and then on the next slide, there is uh, our. So at Durham, we uh, in our in our last match we were able to play, we actually had a critical breakage where we weren't able to drive anymore. We exploded one of our bearings into our gearbox as well as the pulley accompanying it. Um, so we would not have been able to play. So that, uh, following that, we had a bit of a design change on the drivetrain side the, a few days later. So just in the next slide, there's the photos of the new drivetrain. Uh, we just switched to a thicker box channel and changed to pneumatic wheels because we found that we needed a lot more shock absorption. So um, that's pretty much just the overview. We used six inch pneumatic wheels for a six wheel West Coast drive. We changed to belts throughout the season just because we found the the amount of power that the Falcons had was uh, the chains could easily easily pop off, and we had a few incidents with those. Um, and then we have two speed. We are seven feet per second in low gear, and the fifteen feet per second in high gear. Um, we typically only ran at about fifty percent power at Durham, just because uh, personally I was a bit new to driving, and we didn't need to, we didn't need all that speed. Uh, we were going to up the speed a little bit for our next competition. Uh, just because like uh, our drive team, myself and our operator felt a little bit more comfortable with our drivetrain. I know in our first match, it was a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare. I, I, my first match of the season of or ever was uh, we got beached on, num on a number of balls playing uh, two no shows and a, and a uh, disconnected robot. So. So then our, here's our intake. We originally had a, uh, a pivoted intake uh, to pick up the balls over the bumper. Um, so those are some of our iterations. Then our week one competition iteration. And on the next slide, we have our final iteration, which we uh, made just after Durham. Uh, the, so this is a four bar intake. It's made out of half inch high density polyethylene, which you can just get from McMaster car. Uh, it's three balls wide. It has two rollers, which are made out of PVC. Uh, so we, as I said, we switched to a four bar design. Uh, it's a Falcon 500 driven with a 41 reduction. And the main reason we changed to a four bar was because we found at Durham, we lost a lot of balls from falling out of our intake, which was a uh, bit of an issue because we could lose e we could lose points that are easy for us to get and occasionally we'd lose two or three balls and like to uh, to us we wanted to be able to maximize our shooting capabilities for the amount of time we are driving so our cycle times so then um so here are just some images of our uh it extended the extended after we changed it um we found it it didn't take the balls really well we didn't lose any balls so uh, here's our indexer prototype. So our indexer was the um, was the biggest design change this season. Originally, we spent about two three weeks uh, prototyping our mechanum indexer. Um, some issues we came into with that was the mechanum wheels were way too grippy. They would uh, suck the balls in. So to do this, we tried. I'm not sure if you can see. We put some uh, green painters tape on them. Which um, we we've had numerous other suggestions since uh, showing off our robot a bit, but we found that uh, we needed to have a lot a, a lot uh, lower friction on the mechanum wheels. So we ended up having to switch to a different um, a different indexer design, which uh, shout out to Rembrandt's um, from the Netherlands. Uh, we based off our, our indexer off of their design, uh, which we quickly changed to after about two days of designing, and then we moved right into our final design. So would you say the indexer was the most challenging part of the robot? Because I know that was the biggest challenge for a lot of teams this year. What would you say was the most challenging part? I'd say for us, it was the it was the biggest unknown for us because we like we all know, uh, like you spin a wheel and a, you like you can shoot a ball, you can then take a ball. Um, it's ultimately what you have to change for the game, but the indexer was pretty new to us. Nobody on our team had ever designed an indexer. We didn't really 
we hadn't really we didn't really have any experience like there wasn't really good resources for looking at indexing balls um and it was definitely like it was what we had to come up with this season so here's our final design we uh switch to a uh sort of more of a um a ramp design uh so it just has one rotating belt on the side which uh rotates backwards to unjam the balls uh, we run at a uh, 20 to 1 reduction off of a gearbox and then a 2 to 3 belt reduction uh, all running off a of bag, bag motor. Uh, we found that one uh, one thing that we found was we could get away with only using one belt uh, as opposed to having two belts, one on each side. Uh, this really helped us save on weight because uh, we would have had to have two uh, we would have had to have two gearboxes, two motors, uh, two belts. It, it really saved a lot of weight as well as uh, if we wanted to maybe save on the weight and just try to link the two up, we didn't really have the space in our robot. so. So then next we have what we call our intestine. Uh, here are some of the different uh, prototypes that we did. We we found uh, we had some issues with balls getting stuck on each other. Uh, if we wanted to do a curved one, we ended up deciding after we decided to go for a tall uh, a tall robot as well as uh, we decided on our indexer prototype that we were going to do just uh, one straight shot up to our shooter. So we just use uh, some belt the same belts as the indexer from McMaster Car uh, that feed right up into our uh, into our shooter. So in the final design, um, it acts as a storage device. We can transport the balls from the indexer to the shooter. Uh, ideally, it holds three balls at a time. Uh, it's driven off of a bag motor with a 40 to 1 reduction. We actually changed that to a 775 Pro after Durham because we wanted to have a bit more speed. Um, one thing we did find it was an issue at Durham was we found um, how it worked was there is a sensor at the, at the bottom of the uh, intestine. And if it felt that there was a ball there, it would bring it up into the intestine. However, we found that um, with, when the balls got less and less tacky, they would eventually bounce out in and out of the sensor because they wouldn't be held in anymore by the friction. So we ended up having to change our code a little bit after Durham to prevent this, which is also what allowed us to uh, run at a lot a faster rate. So that would have increased our shooting speed as well as um, our rate of fire. So, And then next is our uh, shooter prototype. So we prototyped two different shooter designs, technically three if you, uh, you want to call it that. So we had a... Uh, a two-wheel shooter design. We actually ended up changing the four wheels for our prototype, uh, which we would rotate uh, to do a top-wheel shooter or a side-wheel shooter. We found we had a bit too much inconsistency as well as the balls would bounce out just because it had so much power. Um, and then on the right, you'll see our uh, finer, final prototype, which was actually, uh, if anybody recognizes that, that's our 2012 shooter, which we saved uh, which we saved from our robot, which we salvaged just uh, this past summer. Um, so we actually reused the shooter, just changing some of the compression as well as the gearbox was a custom gearbox, which we made from three sims, uh, which then led into our final prototype, just on the next slide. So on the final pro uh, sorry, final design, not prototype. Um, so we, uh, we don't have a variable hood. We decided that we, instead of having a variable hood, we found that with the tall robot, we were able to actually get the range we needed and just be able to vary, uh, vary our shooter speed. Uh, something that sort of um, is a bit different on our flywheel. What we did was we added a bunch of plastic rollers as opposed to a um, one piece of, for example, like Lexan or any other piece. Um, so what we found was this preserved some of the velocity of the shots. So it would um, sort of reduce on a bit of the backspin and allow us to get a bit more uh, a bit more range of our shots since we wanted to originally use our tall robot to shoot from behind the trench. However, we found after Durham when all the balls sort of lost their tackiness that it wasn't necessarily achievable after the first few matches of the competition. Um, so use a. So was there ever like any talk about like an adjustable hood versus a turret, or did that never come up? Um, so what we basically decided was when we were deciding between a tall and a short robot, we decided if we did a short robot, we would definitely need a an adjustable hood, and then if we were to do a tall robot, we that would be depend on our prototyping. But also we decided if we were going to do a tall robot, we were going to go for a turret as opposed to turning the drivetrain, which we found definitely was beneficial when we went to our first competition. Um, so when we uh, made this shooter, we uh, definitely decided to go with the turret. And we were originally going to add uh, some variability. We found that the only variability we would need is about five degrees. So what we did was we were just, we had a, a design where we just flipped down a little top plate, which would uh, change the angle a little bit. But we found after a um, bit of prototyping and a bit of variability in our PID tuning that we didn't actually need to. So in our final design, we have 200 degrees of motion on the uh, turret, and then we have a a uh, custom bevel bevel gear feeder underneath, which feeds the balls from the intestine into the uh, into the shooter. So how, what that does is it centers the ball, so it doesn't matter which position the shooter's in. Uh, we will get the same, the same feed um, into the shooter, and then um, yeah. Awesome. Oh, so we do have wheel. a 
we do have a quick question from Chad from Beza Alganum. So he's asking, I'm seeing a lot. He's seen a lot of thick plates on the robot. So on your intake and your shooter hood, and he's asking, how was that constructed? Is that CNC and what's the material? Is it HDPE? Uh, so what, yeah, uh, he's correct. So we use uh, a lot of HDPE from McMaster. Um, so you can just order that off McMaster car. Uh, we use a half inch thick, and we just cut it on our on our CNC router. Perfect. So, so here's our. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, so you want to tell us about your arm? Um, it's a 610 arm. I've pretty much seen this since like 2016, a yeah. little earlier too, probably. So tell so, us about yeah. like the whole Our arm, uh, very original, if you uh, haven't noticed. It was like first time we've done it, as you said. Um, if you just go through the slides. Uh, oh, wait, no. 2011, 2016, 2018, 2019, and now 2020. So, um, 610 so we 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 do a lot of arms um we've had a lot of success with them in the past so this year we decided we were a tall robot we wanted to do one central arm in the middle so we wouldn't sway side to side and we found it worked very well for us so um so this is our original iteration of the arm uh we didn't do much prototyping for the arm uh since we've uh done a, we've had a lot of experience with them so what we did was we did some uh did our preliminary design and that adjusted based on what our robot was going to look like and we made uh, some changes. Uh, the most significant change was we decided this year to change from using constant four springs or a lead screw to actually use, sorry, from using um, a gas spring and a lead screw to using constant four springs. So this year's arm, we use three stages. Um, the arm extends with, as I said, a constant, uh, constant four spring. Uh, some of the only changes we really made were we uh, moved the gearbox to the outside of the arm as opposed to being integrated to the bottom which gave us a lot more range as well as it allowed us to store more balls in our intake because the arm was uh, a little bit low on the robot. Uh, we also added um, we also added some rubber to the hooks in our first few matches of the Durham competition because we were sliding on the, the bar a lot. And then finally, it's uh, driven off of one Falcon 500, which is attached to um, our gearbox. And then we have a, um, a, a winch at the bottom to make sure that we don't fall off after the match. Uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and take a little break here while Tyler goes ahead and talks about one of our sponsors, Stryker. So, Tyler, want to go, go ahead and come on? Yeah, something I really want to talk about with Stryker here today. Uh, you know, times are times are strange right now, right? Lots lots going on, uh, and like most companies, you know, Stryker is, is fine, trying to figure out how they can best help the community for things. So, a couple things I want to mention tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have a special show uh, talking about uh, COVID-19 responses with experts in the industry. So we have uh, Vice President from Stryker coming in, Jerry. Uh, we also have uh, a, a name that maybe some will recognize from long ago. Joe Johnson is coming in. Uh, doc, Dr. Joe is coming in to talk. And we also have uh, Mike Stark, our very own Mike Stark, who's also a registered nurse tomorrow. So please check that out uh, starting 8 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. Uh, but our friends at Stryker actually have developed something super cool that I want to tell you about uh, called the Emergency Relief bed they are cranking out uh like their goal is to crank out a thousand of these per day to have ready and available uh for people when they need them this is something that striker came together and they said you know what you know we're a medical uh manufacturer we make leading products but what's something that we can create that's going to actually help immediately right now and so striker has uh put their minds together and come out with this emergency relief bed and they are starting to crank these out. And I just want to just give Striker a big shout out for that. You know, of course, you can check them out uh, for employment. And they want to hire people who are in first to come work for them. But I think this is something just super cool that uh, they're finding their way to respond uh, to COVID-19. But if you're interested in uh, careers, internships, anything like that, and you actually want to work for a company who will support you being in first, go to careers.stryker.com forward slash first and go check them out. So um, just a little bit of a brief history. Uh, some people were asking about this. So our original design in 2011 was a gas spring powered. It was three stages and it was uh, guided with um, metal ball bearings. 2016, uh, same story. It was a three, uh, three stage extension with bearing guided and it was a gas spring powered. Um, and then 2018, um, we changed to a five, a five stage extension just to fit the size of our robot. And then we uh, used the gas spring once again and then the metal ball bearings. 2019 was our biggest uh, our biggest uh, design change on the 610 arm uh, since this year it wasn't being used for a climb or it, and it wasn't being used for uh, lifting like lighter objects. So this year we actually changed to uh, a lead screw uh, lead screw design where we would drive it off of a Versa Planetary and a 775 Pro at the bottom of the arm, and then we actually changed to plastic custom rollers, which we uh, would lay ourselves uh, mainly because it saved on weight, it uh, reduced the cost of the arm. 
arm as well as we could make whatever size we wanted, inner diameter, outer diameter, whatever size we wanted. And then finally, we also um, had to. We also found that um, when we were using arms that were um, that could potentially get impacted, such as in 2011 and 2019, we found that if the arm stage ever um, flared out in the top, it could uh, like cause the arm to uh, wobble a bit and have a poor extension and de-extension. So we actually had to add um, about a quarter inch, half inch um, brace at the top of our arm. We didn't carry this on this year because our arm was never in the uh, uh, was never in the um, range of fire for any other robots to smack into. But if we were, or if it was, we would definitely have to add um, a lot more uh, beef to the top of the arms. And then this year, um, we just we changed to our constant force spring because we found that the gas spring would be very expensive for the extension we needed. And then we changed back to a three stage extension, and once again, it's uh, guided by custom plastic rollers. So you mentioned like beefing up the end of the arm. So how would a team go about actually beefing up the end of the arm? Like how do they attach that material? How do you guys do it? Uh, so what we did was in 2019, uh, we actually machined a custom uh, brace, which would fit ar uh, around all of our rollers as well as um, as, as well as just fit over the arm if we were to take off the intake. Um, we custom machined that on our uh, CNC milling machine, which um, which we know may, many teams may not have. Uh, originally, the design was to have essentially like a puzzle piece design that would fit over all of them, and then we'd uh, bolt them together, and it would act as essentially thickening up the material on the top. That was our original design. And the only reason we went for the CNC milling was because it was a much, much simpler for us, and we thought it would be a bit more reliable, uh, given it was all one piece. Gotcha. Speaking of reliable, your six fall auto. Tell me a little bit about that, the pathing, and why that was so, the road that was chosen. So this year. Uh, so what we when we were talking about auto in the beginning of the season, we wanted we wanted to make sure we had a like a really great auto, and I think we we proved that at Durham. Uh, so we used motion profiling to do the path of our robot, and then um, I'm personally not on the programming side, so I can't tell you mo more than that. Um, so at Durham, we um, first few matches we tweaked our auto uh, a little bit, like the speeds with the balls getting more and more worn out. Um, so we had two primary auto paths. We were would shoot the three balls in our intake, and then pick up the three from the trench. Uh, the video playing right now is actually uh, one from Durham, where we technically is seven, but we only got uh, we only got six in. We picked up one of the balls that rolled over. Uh, so how the auto worked is it would just keep on shooting any balls that came in the intake. It wasn't necessarily looking for uh, six balls. And then, so we wanted to make sure we had a really uh, good auto. And then we had our five ball auto, where we'd shoot the three in our robot, and then we'd go back to the other side, to the uh, to the opposing alliance's trench, and steal their balls that were at the front of the trench, hoping they just weren't there. And then after Durham, we actually uh, were on the way to getting our uh, an eight and a ten ball auto, which we were working on uh, up until the uh, season was suspended. So that was looking really promising. So as a robot that was like shooting from behind the trench, you said you made some adjustments in your shooting, um, depending on the ball wear. Um, what kind of adjustments were those? So you said it was just like flywheel speed. Uh, yeah, definitely. Like we had to up the flywheel speed as well as uh, we had to change some of our PID tuning when the balls got more and more worn down. When we originally were testing, we were testing with our balls we had prototyped with. So they were already pretty worn down and we didn't have much variability. But we found that given the distance, the, um, the more distance you had to shoot from, the more var variability you had from the shots. And if you ever had a ball that was new to the field or a ball that was uh, had a big hole in it, you weren't going to get the same shot as if they were all the same. So we ended up uh, midway through Durham deciding we were going to go for uh, what we called the money shots in the uh, triangle zone or just in front of the uh, initiate, just behind the initiation line, uh, which was what we practiced most of the time in driving. Uh, we also uh, didn't, esti we also underestimated how easy it would be to cross the field, which um, when we were originally designing our, uh, talking about designing our robot tall versus short robot, we, we thought that that would be the biggest issue, but we didn't account for how easy it would be to go over the, with the carpet in the middle, which definitely was a big advantage to us in Durham as well as in practicing, so. Right on, cool. Um, you want to tell me a little bit about the scouting app, how 610 does their scouting and how your line selection process works. So 610, we're very fortunate to be sponsored by TELUS. They provide us with uh, data for all of our competitions. So what we do is we have uh, we have six students scouting each match. One will scout each. Uh, so one is assigned to scout uh, red one for a series of matches. And then what they do is they input on our web-based scouting app, all the data for that specific team, where they shoot from. Little We can show a heat map, their accuracy from different spots as well as if they're, for example, playing defense, where they like to play defense. If they're easily defended, we'll have little notes. So, yeah. Cool, yeah, the heat maps look like really cool to me, um, especially like just looking at where teams are spending the majority of their time during the match. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, so has your scouting system like developed over time or is it just something you've had for a while? 
Uh, well, our scouting system changes every year uh, because based on the different game, we um, we're fortunate this year that uh, we have a younger member who's leading, uh, who's in grade 11. So we'll be able to carry his experience over to next year for our scouting app, uh, who is leading our scouting app this year. Uh, we were very happy with our scouting app this year. It changes every year. Um, it's a great it's a great tool for the programmers to use as uh, everybody on programming cons uh, contributes one module of the code to the scouting app. And um, generally, it's just it just progresses over time. We originally um, originally our scouting app a few years ago was um, still a web based scouting app, but we didn't necessarily have access to all the data for all the students and just keeps on building. Yeah. And were you guys using like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi before um, going like all web based? Or um, as long as I've been on the team, we've uh, been going all web based. Um, I personally can't speak of before that, but right on. Um, so how much of a difference do you think like a scouting app makes versus just like hard paper scouting and just like qualitative scouting? Do you, like, how does that affect the extent design? I think what really helps for us is because with all the data that we gather, we're able to, uh, for example, sort it based on um, the amount of auto balls that do. And we're just really easily able to configure our data to show the different aspects of a robot that we're looking for. If we want to, for example, find the robot that spends the most time in this spot of the field, we're easily able to, from our data, find that without having to uh, like go back into our paper data and, and sort it based off of that. It just gives us a lot more freedom to look for specific data we want to in a really quick matter a manner of time with the amount of time we have after um, the first day of, um, of qualifications. So, right on. And being on drive team, how does the process work? Because I guess just having the scouting app, it makes it a lot easier to get that data in real time to your drive coach and like make your uh, match decisions based on that. So, you want to speak a little bit to that? Uh, so, typically, what we do is we have um, we have our head of strategy as well as um, some other students who work with the head of strategy to uh, scout each match. So, what we have is our strategy head will come to our drive team as well as our drive coach, and we'll talk about the plan for the next match. We're going to meet up with all the other teams, see what's going to happen. Uh, we also look at, uh, we sometimes look at the scouting data, but typically uh, the scouting data isn't 100% accurate until we have enough, uh, we have enough sample size. So what we do is we like to see like the different observations, talk to the teams. Um, but it's really, it really comes down to shout out to Ben who watches all the teams and knows everything about them to plan our matches. Just a follow up question for me here. Um, you guys were the number four Alliance captain. Uh, at your event. Talk to me about your alliance partners. Uh, what was the process into selecting them? Why did you think they were a good fit for your alliance? Um, I'll, I'll take my best shot at this. Um, I, I was, I was uh, personally, since I was on drive team, I was not as involved with the picking of the team this year. Um, but Makeshift, we were really happy to work with them. Uh, we were very happy that we were able to work with them. They're uh, like very high on our list for who we wanted to be with. Uh, one thing we thought was great was they could go through the trench and we could go through the rendezvous point and they could uh, go up close to the to the goal and score while we could shoot from either in the trench or in the uh, in the protected zone or into the in the triangle. Um, so then we were also looking for our second alliance partner. We wanted to find somebody who we could hang with to get those extra hang points. So yeah. All right, I know a question that a couple of people were asking earlier was um, was there ever any thought given towards adding a buddy bar to get that RP or lifting another robot? Um, when we were, we were considering adding a buddy bar at the beginning of the season, but we ultimately decided that we wanted to focus on our efforts on making like be uh, better different subsystems. So we, for example, wanted to focus our, our like student body on making, for example, the best shooter possible, which would put us further ahead. Also, we, we were any considerations for a buddy bar or the uh, control panel spinner. We were thinking about adding on uh, pre Waterloo or uh, pre provincials because we found that uh, at Durham, not as many teams were able to climb, so we didn't think it was necessarily as uh, as usable because typically the all of the bar was open. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Aiden, thank you so much for coming on. That's unfortunately all the time we have, but that was a really cool um, little in-depth dive to your team and the robot, which is really interesting, and I'm sure everyone else appreciate it. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, and at the same time, I'd also like to thank all of our moderators in chat and our producer behind the scenes, Tyler. Um, guys, we know the season has ended prematurely. We don't know what's happening. There's a lot of uncertainty, but there's some certainty on the first updates now show schedule. We're going to have great teams on like 610 week after week. So make sure you tune in to, you know, see your favorite teams. And this is the place to go for your first robotics. So on behalf of myself, Tyler, Aiden, and all of our moderators in chat, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys later. Take care. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.
Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent. 